principles underlying the practice of intramedullary nailing. The guide will not discuss surgical techniques, which will be learned in the practical sessions. Let us start with a brief historical introduction to intramedullary nailing. As early as 1858, Nicolaisen of Norway had used intramedullary nails for femoral neck fractures, although there exist no critical reviews of his results. Smith-Peterson in Boston developed a four-flanged, then a three-flanged, or trifin, intramedullary nail for femoral neck fractures. A few years later, Lorenz Böhler of Vienna was advocating the intervention of Smith-Peterson, originally an open reduction and open fixation through the incision illustrated here. The original Smith-Peterson nail suffered problems including corrosion, and the technique was soon to be modified. Sven Johansson of Gothenburg, Sweden, described a cannulated trifin nail, which he inserted over a guide wire after a manipulative reduction under X-ray control. This is the sort of intraoperative X-ray apparatus that would have been used at that time. Gerhard Kuncher in Kiel developed diaphyseal intramedullary nailing. Initially, he used a V-section nail and then the classical cloverleaf elastic nail. Herzog practiced lengthening osteotomy of the femur, fixed with an intramedullary nail that was locked using an external jig attached to the proximal end of the nail, as early as 1951. By 1953, Kuncher had his proximal and distal locking detensor nail. Elastic intramedullary nailing, using Kuncher's classical slotted cloverleaf nail, relies on the squeezing of the nail slot as it is introduced tightly into the medullary cavity. This results in a tendency of the nail to spring open, which exerts pressure on the endosteal surface of the bone where the nail is in contact. This produces a tight friction fit over the length of the bone where that contact exists. The human femur has a curve convex anteriorly that forms part of the circumference of a circle whose radius varies from 0.9 to 1.4 metres. Clearly, any femoral intramedullary nail must be shaped to an average curvature and yet be capable of entering a range of differently curved femora. Some nails have a certain flexibility to adapt slightly to different curves. Others are rigid and curvature mismatch has to be dealt with by over-reaming the medullary cavity and using a smaller diameter nail. This will be considered later. Nail stiffness is determined by many factors and it can influence design. Nails must resist both bending and torsional deformation. The factors influencing nail stiffness include the material of the nail. This is usually stainless steel or titanium alloy. Stainless steel has good strength and stiffness characteristics and is easy to handle during manufacture. It is also well tolerated by the body tissues, except in nickel-sensitive individuals. Titanium alloys are also used. They are a little less stiff than stainless steel and have very low toxicity. Unfortunately, nails of titanium alloy are more susceptible to weakening if pierced by holes or abraded during insertion, so-called notch sensitivity. A notch concentrates all the applied force at one point, producing high local stress. The notch acts as a stress riser. The nail may be solid or hollow. Experimental work has shown that, if infected, a hollow nail provides a sheltered environment in which bacteria can proliferate, whereas a solid nail does not. A solid nail is stiffer for a given diameter. This may be advantageous in resisting deforming forces, but the rigidity means that the nail cannot adapt to any curvature mismatch between the bone and the nail. Nail stiffness is also affected by whether the nail is slotted or unslotted. An unslotted cylinder is stiffer than a slotted one, especially in resistance to torsion. On the other hand, a slotted nail can adapt to small variations in the radius of curvature of the medullary cavity by deforming slightly at the slot. 
A slotted nail can also be used for its elastic friction grip if the fracture is near the isthmus of the medullary cavity, thereby obviating the need to lock the nail. This is, in fact, a rare technique nowadays. Using a slotted nail that will deform slightly to adjust the radius of curvature of the bone allows the use of a larger diameter nail than a solid or unslotted, less flexible nail of the same radius of curvature. The diameter of the nail also affects the stiffness. For a cloverleaf nail, the resistance to bending, so-called area moment of inertia, varies according to the cube of the diameter. For a slotted nail, the resistance to bending is greater if the slot is on the tension side. Torsional stiffness is also proportional to the nail diameter. For a hollow nail, unslotted or slotted, resistance to bending is proportional to the wall thickness. Working length affects the nail stiffness. The working length is that length of that section of a nail which spans an unstable bone segment and which is unsupported by bone. The bone may support the nail as a result of the interference or frictional fit of an elastic nail or by locking the bone to the nail with cross screws, interlocked or locked nailing. With a nail locked on either side of a multifragmentary diaphyseal segment, which is axially unstable, the working length is the distance between the inboard locking screws. The greater the working length, the more a nail will deform for a given bending or torsional force. The further apart the inboard locking screws, the greater the working length. Reaming, whilst conferring some mechanical advantages, exacts a biological price. For a single plane fracture, the elastic hold of a slotted, unlocked nail, especially in resisting torsional forces, will be effective over a greater length of the bone if the isthmus is reamed to a larger cylindrical diameter. This will also accommodate a larger diameter nail and increase resistance to bending forces. The use of powered reamers generates heat. Poor reamer head design, reamer head bluntness and aggressive forceful reaming techniques can all increase the thermal output and risk causing bone necrosis. This slide shows the area of dead, cooked bone in a femur after reaming, then injecting the experimental animal with methylene blue immediately prior to sacrifice. The mere introduction of an intramedullary nail will damage the endosteal blood supply and cause some degree of avascularity of the inner cortex. Reaming increases this effect. As shown by Rhinelander, in the absence of infection, the avascular inner cortex will revascularize fairly quickly. It has to be recognized, however, that Rhinelander's experiments were conducted on intact bones in the absence of fractures. In the fractured bone, after intramedullary nailing, this revascularization may well take longer than is classically stated. The introduction of an unreamed nail delivers a lesser insult to the endosteal blood supply than a reamed nail. These composite figures show two stacks of diaphyseal cross-sections, where the white is avascular bone and the magenta is vascular bone. There is a clearly visible difference between the reamed and unreamed specimens. Other reaming controversies centre around the effect of reaming on pulmonary function in the polytraumatised patient, especially in the presence of a chest injury, and the advisability of reaming in open fractures. These debates will not be visited in this study guide. Finally, an important factor is the choice of the proximal insertion point. This should be in line with the medullary cavity and is usually in the piriform fossa. For slotted nails, there is a certain margin as the nail can adapt to a certain degree by twisting and bending a little, but a solid nail, incorrectly inserted, can cause iatrogenic fractures even if the nail's radius of curvature matches exactly that of the bone. 
In summary, you should now understand a brief history of intramedullary nailing, those mechanical and design features of nails that determine their stiffness, features of nails that influence their surgical application, features of nails that influence surgical technique, and the vascular impact of intramedullary nailing on bone.